Okay. All right. Um, so um, earlier on, I was just giving you um, or talking to you about what would happen tomorrow, which is the day three. Okay. Um, so um, which what's going to happen today, um, Roy is going to do a quick recap um, of what um, he taught us yesterday. Um, so if today is your first time, or maybe chances, you know, um, uh, yesterday, like I got a few emails from people that, oh, I was really busy, my background was noisy, so um, I find it would be difficult to follow uh, what Roy was, you know, taught us. And then, you know, you still have the chance, you know, to learn it again. So Roy is going to do a quick recap of what we were taught yesterday so that he will bring every one of us up to speed. All right, that's the whole idea. Then on day two, which is today, um, we're going to go into ISO um, 27,017. And the plan is um, Roy is going to walk us through um, the entire um, 27,017, you know, from, you know, taking us from the, the scope, the context, and the structure of that standard. Uh, that's the whole idea. It will walk us through it, explaining what it means. And, you know, um, I, I think I, I, uh, at the end of it, there was going to be like a kind of, you know, summary of uh, what 27,017 is. Um, the extra controls that are there and how it is different, you know, um, from 27,002. Okay, so the overview. Um, then what we now follow is um, Roy is going to narrow in into uh, the controls, all right, uh, which are the annexes. So for some of you, um, you're already familiar with the 27,002 or 27,001, all right, uh, but what would follow here um, is um, each of those controls. Um, Roy is going to narrow. He's going to teach us uh, what access, um, asset management control is. Um, it's going to take us through um, access control. Um, it's going to take us to um, HR controls as well. So all of that, as it relates to cloud environment, um, is going to walk us um, through it. There's going to be um, some um, 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 information around implementation guidance as well. Um, so you just want to watch out um, for that as well. Then um, all the extended control sets that is built in into 27,017. Um, yes, uh, we're going to spend quality time on that as well because that is the difference between the 27,002 and the 27,017. And usually when you go for an interview, these are the sort of things that they want to check, you know, the, the sort of questions that they would ask you. So especially, you know, if you have it on your CV that you have a knowledge of both, then somebody would ask, okay, what are the different, all right? And the extended control uh, is what they're actually asking you um, about. And, you know, um, there are a few of them, extended control, about seven or nine of them, but Roy, again, is going to walk us through what that means and how it relates to ISMS. Then lastly, uh, we're going to have the data, the cloud, uh, sorry, the cloud, the data itself. Um, as most of you know that, you know, uh, you can store different kinds of data uh, within the cloud um, environment. Uh, but for the purpose of this training, uh, we're going to focus more on personal identifiable information, okay? And then more importantly as well, we're going to look at location, jurisdiction, I put it here, um, and how regulation actually drives, um, um, how location, you know, drives um, regulation. So where you have different instances of cloud, where they are, so where you have different instances of your cloud and where the data are stored. Um, so for example, now, um, um, Microsoft as, as yours definitely have an instance um, of their cloud here in the UK and also in Ireland as well. And if you are in the United States and, um, you know, you, your processing date, if your company is based in the United States and you have the instance of the cloud here, uh, where data is also resident here as well, then you have to worry about GDPR. You know, not really worry about GDPR, but at least you have to have an understanding of the regulation that governs this jurisdiction. The same as well. So you can imagine if you have a business somewhere in Nigeria, you know, um, and all right, you, you also subscribe to a cloud service that is based here in the UK, and the instance of that cloud service is in the highland, all right? Again, don't forget Nigeria also have an equivalent of GDPR now, it is called NDPR, you know, so it's called Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. There's actually a copycat um, of GDPR, so for some of you uh, that you're not aware. Um, so again, you have to worry about that. Uh, not worry, but you have to think about, all oh, right, Nigeria has got NDPR, and here is the instance of the cloud here in the UK, which is GDPR, all right? So 
what is the difference? You know, what, what do you have to do? So Roy's going to, you know, really, really narrow in on that. And I think lastly, um, we're going to be talking about how 27,017 um, apply, you know, to ISMS. And ISMS is 27,001 or two. So that would then also the market value uh, or the market share um, for 27,000, the market, no, the, the market acceptance uh, for 27,000. And 17. And um, that's how we're going to round up today, then tomorrow, the assessment and also the career progression for those uh, that are interested. And more importantly, as well, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about in the various offers that we have um, for you, uh, for as many that are interested. Um, so if you're interested in um, ISO 27001, um, lead implementer, lead auditor, um, you want to do ISO 27017, you know, certification, you want to do CSIM, CSSP, uh, CCSP, and all of those certification courses uh, that would help you. You want to get your hands dirty for that, hands on training, and on some of, you know, uh, different courses within the cybersecurity domain or cloud security. Then we're going to be sharing all of the offers that we have. We're going to be sharing it with you tomorrow. So tomorrow is a big day, and um, I would encourage you, you know, avail yourself of the opportunity um, of what we have, and perhaps maybe that would help you um, to achieve um, your career goals. All right. Uh, so without wasting too, without wasting time, um, so I believe um, um, Roy is available and ready. Um, so Tune, um, over to you. I don't know how you want to play it. Um, do you want to drive it, or do you want to flip control to him? Um, so, but yeah, I will stop here and uh, you can do uh, your magic. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Wally. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, Roy is already in. So Roy, do you want to take control now? Hello, Roy. Can you hear me? Okay, while well, I was still waiting. Hello, Roy, can you, can you speak into your mic? Okay, guys, bear, uh, just bear with me a second. And for those that have, so while um, today is trying to sort that out, um, for those of you that have questions, we can see a few questions there. Um, someone was asking if the training is going to start at 6.30. Yes, it did actually. Um, but um, we're just waiting for our, our tutor to you know, get his laptop and everything set. Then we can um, just kick off um, a few questions around um, someone was asking about if we've got question bank for CISNP. Um, we can take that offline. Um, if you need help in that area, we might be able to um, help you. Um, yeah, we might, and I'm going to be talking about the, um, that particular certification tomorrow. Um, so if you're interested, just um, join in. Um, our question is from Inca. Um, in but can't hear anything. Someone said they are in but they can't hear anything. Um, I believe a lot of people can hear me. Um, so if you cannot hear me, Victor, um, then I would advise that um, you uh, maybe restart your system. Um, I would advise you to do so. Um, I think everybody can hear me. I believe so. Um, yeah, thank you, Ben. And those um, that I've just confirmed. So we do apologize, just maybe a technical glitch um, from, um, from Roy. Um, so let's just wait for him to... Um, get his hand sorted. I think I can hear him. Roy, we can hear you, I believe. Hello? Yes, I think we can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that, uh, chaps. It's one of those things with uh, technology. As you know, I'm not in the technology field. 
Sorry about that. Okay, so you you have control now. Yes, I've taken control. Okay, and um, the slide as well. You've taken control of the slide and everything. I've taken it too. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Yeah, you've just shared your slide now. Fantastic. Uh, put it in the presentation mode. Put your slide in the presentation mode. Of course. Yeah. And we are good to go. Here we are. Not yet. Not yet in presentation mode. Yeah. Oh, I'm it is. Anyway, all right. All right. Yeah, good to go. Fantastic. So, uh, welcome everyone to the continuation of the cloud security for space on ISO 27017. Uh, and that's what we'll be looking at today, the uh, standard itself. Uh, don't forget, the things we did from yesterday builds up to this. It's always good to have a justification for the things to do regarding security, especially where you would have pushback from top management if you are in uh, a commercial setting or business setting, you always want to have some kind of justification because what a uh, best practice represents or a standard represents is a well thought out systematic way of delivering security, whether it's cloud security, network security, application security, or whatever it is. So 27,017 is a, is a fantastic standard. So let's uh, dive into it. Now, what is 27,017? The current version is the 2015 version, and by title, it is called the Information Technology Security Techniques. In essence, it is a code of practice. For those of us who may have done some work in ISO 27001, you know we have two documents that go hand in hand when implementing 27001, or even auditing it in the suite of standards, which we call the 27,000 family. 27,017 is a member of that family, and it is based off of 27,002, which is a supplementary document and also titled a code of practice for implementing 27,001. So it means this standard 27,017, being a part of that family, is built on the existing security controls in 27,002. Essentially what it does is it creates a matrix or a mapping for security controls applicable specifically to cloud computing situation. So it works alongside all these other standards. One, which is if you implement 27,017, you won't get a certificate that shows you are ISO 27,017 certified it will come in the scope of the 27,001 to show that you have 27,017 consideration, cloud consideration within your 27,001 implementation. Okay, so 27,001 is a standard, a requirement document for managing that overall information security management system. And it's also sometimes called an ISMS itself. So it's an information security management system standard. 27,002, lists uh, security controls which you will select after doing your risk assessment you select controls to mitigate or to attend to those risks that you would have identified from your risk assessment step so you would select a number of controls there are 114 controls within 27,002 what 27,007 now does is it creates a additional list of controls for operating the cloud plus your overall security management system uh, risks. So you have controls in addition to what you would have done for more generic information security. And then 27,018 is a guideline specifically addressing how to protect personal data in the cloud. So it's a privacy standard what's specifically for cloud. So it works hand in hand in 27,017. As you will see when we go along, We'll talk about privacy and data protection. So 27,018 addresses personal data, whether it's sensitive or not sensitive. And in terms of its structure, it is similar to 27,002. Same uh, nomenclature it uses, same uh, 
way of addressing clauses and also listing the controls in terms of what broadly the, the aim to achieve, the objective, and then the specific controls that fulfill uh, those objectives. Okay. Now, organizations by themselves will decide which controls are relevant. What we mean by that is you would have done your risk assessment and picked specific controls that address that. If you do not do an activity in your environment, you will not be picking controls just for the sake of it. So your risk assessment will point you to what controls you should select. And so it depends on your status, whether you are a cloud service provider, a customer, whether you are uh, a controller in this day and age now. Remember this standard was in 2015. So when we consider it and we look at it, we have to also use the uh, compliance control in 2001 to show that personal data applies to us. And so that's where that comes in, whether you are a, a, uh, a controller, whether you're a processor, whether you're a service provider, whether you're a customer, whether in different instances you can be both, okay? So it provides cloud-specific controls and the way to implement them. It provides additional information beyond just listing the controls to say whether it should be deployed in a preventive manner, whether it should be as a detective control from the list, or whether it is as a corrective control as well. While in 2002, we have control listed from clauses 5 to 18, uh, make it, creating 14 domains or 14 clauses, and we have 35 control objectives. Yeah, uh, in that standard, and 114 controls in 2002. This standard provides guidance on 37 controls in 2002. So it takes from that 114, it takes 37 controls and also features seven new controls. So when you're speaking with people, you want to be, you want to show that you're knowledgeable. There are 114 in 2002, 37 from that 114 in 2017, and seven new controls. So altogether in 2017, there are 44 controls. Yep. So cloud. But the cloud standard 2017 makes it sector specific. If you are, if you operate with cloud computing, then you would select 2017 to help you with the controls and the implementation. So it is based on 2002, as we've said, was published in 2015. Typically, ISO standards uh, run for five years and then they are reviewed. Not all of them fit into those five years. Sometimes they go beyond that, sometimes it's quicker. So they do a supplementary standard depending on dynamics in the industry. So this has been there for uh, five years now. It's due for revision in the coming year. Uh, hopefully it will be done soon. And you can actually track the movement of the revision as well. So this standard is applicable to the provision and use of cloud services. And as we've seen, has seven new controls. And guidance on the implementation, specific cloud services that are not found in 2002. 37 found in 2002, but seven uh, totally new controls. So it focuses on the protection of cloud services. In the way you deliver it, you would have a, an idea of the context of the business and then apply the controls in that manner. Just like we saw ISO 31000 give us a feel of how risk management would be applied. These are the supplementary controls. As you can see, seven of them. If you've done ISO 27001 and you're familiar with uh, 27002 as well, then you already know those controls. They are listed in order of clauses, uh, objective, and then the specific controls that fulfill those objectives. These here now are the seven. We have shared roles and responsibilities. We had a look at that during the training yesterday. We saw a discussion about shared roles and responsibilities between uh, providers and customers. 
8.1.5, that clause talks about removal and return of cloud customer assets after the termination of the contract. There has to be a control around that. Otherwise, you might have data leakage. You might lose customer data if that's what you do. So there's a control around what you should do when um, a contract ends between a customer and a service provider, whoever they may be. And don't forget that sometimes you find uh, you might be a customer of software, or that software you are consuming, the provider might be consuming platform as a service from someone else, or infrastructure as a service from someone else. Or as a matter of fact, may only be a reseller. So you need to understand the journey of your cloud services. And so that's why these controls uh, are there. There must also be the protection and segregation of virtual computing environments. Remember, we started and said the foundation of virtual of uh, cloud computing is in virtualization. So we we'll look at how to harden virtual machines to meet your business needs, making sure you have only the services you need and all the stuff like that. Uh, procedures for the administrative operations of cloud computing environment, how to select the technical people, how to do your own checks as well with regards to that uh, relationship. Also, enabling customers to monitor relevant activities within the environment, whether you should have a right to audit or whether you should just rely on due diligence on paper and things like that. And of course, the checks on uh, certificates and the rest of them. And finally, alignment of security management for virtual and physical networks. So these controls are quite relevant till now, until we hopefully get a revision and we'll see what the, those revisions will be. My guess would be that the revisions will be around uh, new acts like the California Privacy Act and things like that. And of course, GDPR. Okay, so the seven extended controls are in the Annex A. It covers the names A6, A8, A9, A12, and A13. So the Annex is always labeled with an A. And these supplemental controls, the extended controls rather, are additional controls to complement that of Annex A in 27,001. So we'll, we'll have a look at these controls now. 6.1.1 is where we'll start. And of course, cost, we have cloud service customers, we have cloud service providers. If they are both working to secure their relationship and the cloud service, whether consuming or providing, of course, we both will be looking into this standard to give them guidance on how cloud, cloud computing will be secure. But the customer, as you can see, it is recommendation. And that's why the language is the, the cloud service customer should agree. These are the things you should do. So it's implementation guidance. You should agree with the cloud service provider on an appropriate allocation of security roles and responsibilities. Let's know where we stand. Let's know what you would do. Let's know what us as customers would do. Let's allocate security roles. Put how many people on your side will do such, such, and such. Would we be the ones doing patching? Would we be the ones doing configuration management that would be expressed? And so the security roles and responsibilities should be stated in the agreement. The customer should identify and manage the, risk, the relationship. While the provider side, the provider should agree and document an appropriate allocation of security roles and responsibilities, not only with the customers, but with other cloud service providers as well and suppliers. If they don't build everything or create everything within their environment, that means they have suppliers of one or two things. So on their part, they have responsibilities. Control 7.2.2 relates to the human element, which is regarded sometimes as the weakest link in security. So information, uh, human resource security, has to deal with uh, the human element, how we should make them aware, how we should educate them and potentially train them. We train those who are more technical, we educate those who might manage the department or an arm of the business, 
I would make everyone that will be working under our control aware. So uh, awareness, education, and training will be deployed throughout the business. Train some, educate some, make everyone aware. Okay. And so with, with regards to the control as it applies to each party, the service customer should add the following items to their training program and awareness program uh, for different people in the organization. Okay. For different people in the organization, uh, which includes standards and procedures for the use of cloud services. One second. Yeah. So these are all the things that should be included, standards, procedures, and the development of policies as well whether it is generic and corporate security policy or topic specific policies that are related to security, that like password policy, email policies, all that should be included. And of course, uh, the security risks that, that we saw yesterday, the threats would have gone specifically to say, because we work in this manner, because we have uh, this regulation specific to our situation, these are the kind of risks we would have because we have this technology, we have maybe legacy systems you would do your risk assessment based on your context. So everything related to your cloud services and your cloud relationships, and then how you intend to manage those, those risks. Remember to manage those risks, you look into 27,002 and 27,017, and that's what is stated in control 7.2.2. And then of course, you should be aware, you should include system and network environment risks. You should include your services. You should also consider your legal and regulatory regulations plus contractual uh, obligations as well. So all that should go into your awareness program. For the service provider, you must do it similar. You must be a mirror, you must train their employees as well. Because if you don't train your employees, then it potentially is a ticking time bomb because they would not know, uh, they will not have a consensus or cons consistent way of viewing risks, being aware of the kind of risks in your environment. You have to make them aware. Yeah, whether it's from social engineering, whatever it is that you do, your risk management assessment will go into your training. Um, access management is Annex A 8.1. It is about responsibility for assets. So it is actually asset management. Uh, the objective is to identify information assets in scope of the management system and define how to protect them. It's an important part of the ISS as well. So you're, you have to first identify your assets by drawing up a list of, uh, of those assets, identify them know where they are, and figure out if they have hidden assets, whether they have owners listed, and then of course, how to handle those assets. You also classify the assets to see whether they are important, non unimportant, disposable, whatever we want to class them to ensure that they are protected appropriately. Okay, So that is the uh, reason for doing this, to identify the assets that will be as within scope of the cloud service. And the cloud service provider as well, we create an inventory of that and explicitly identify what data is cloud customer uh, data and which ones are cloud service derived data, knowing that they have different kinds of data in their environment. And then we have access control. Uh, and it's the clause and next A9.1. And this is about the business requirements for access control. And the objective of this control is to limit who has access to your processing facilities, which is cloud environment. Which, and this is what we were referring to or alluding to when we talked about the certification. You know, the first control was to delegate or allocate responsibilities on both sides. 
if we want to prove to our customers that we are serious about security, we might go for certification. Because what that shows is that we have been um, assessed independently, potentially, before a certificate is given to us. And so each area that requires looking into or considering, we would have considered, and this being a very important point, whether it's how we recruit staff, how we maintain them while they're in our environment, or how we let them go and ensure they don't take customer data away with them. That's the importance of certification because it means someone has put through all the controls that apply to you and they ensure you have you've implemented them correctly. And then operational security, this implies that cloud service is now running. We had a plan to implement cloud security. We implemented it, we deployed it, and now we are maintaining it is operational. So this is for operation security. Okay. Uh, the, the logs, the logs here, then one second. Hopefully the sound will be better now. In operation security, this is us now running, working as business runs, as business operates, what we refer to as business as usual. We are not in the firefighting phase. We are not in the planning phase. It's not a project phase. It's us doing stuff on a normal day-to-day -day basis, operation security. And if we're operating, we want to ensure that we are locking what is happening. And this comes in our detection phase of implementing controls. We would have implemented preventive controls. The detection control comes when we are operating. If things go wrong, we want to be able to react and correct quickly. So this is the layer of operation. Okay. So we want to record user activities, exceptions, faults, and anything that is adverse to us achieving our objectives. We want to be able to catch it, to know that we can catch it and attend to it in good time. The uh, effectiveness of our detective layer has a very huge bearing on our corrective uh, controls as well. Okay. So for the customer, define requirements for what you want to know, making sure it meets your requirements, whether it's your, re your legal requirements and other statutory requirements, make sure you have an understanding. Why should we be logging? What should we be logging? Or should we just log everything? It should all be business useful logging that you do. If there's a breach, this can become your uh, saving grace in essence. It's the same for the service provider. It should provide logging capabilities to the customer. So while you should define the requirements and tell the provider, this is what we want, we have a responsibility to our customers who are uh, suppliers and partners, to our regulators that drive us with access to uh, have such capabilities. And since we are now sourcing, whether it's software, uh, infrastructure or platform from you, we require you to do that too. So that is the responsibility of the customer. And as such, the provider will be forced to now do that. Otherwise, you move on over to another provider. But you must put that requirement down for them. It's the customer requirement. And then supply relationship. If you have suppliers uh, along the, you know, chain, your chain, your supply chain, the control here, 15.1, is making sure there is security consideration in your supply relationships. How you relate, wherever they are, have you asked them to consider security in whatever it is to deliver to you? This is for you to protect the valuable assets that you make accessible to your suppliers whether it's your networks, whether it's uh, pieces like subcontractors, you might provision pieces and let them use and things like that. You want to ensure that there are security considerations in that. Okay. So for the customer, include uh, the, service, the cloud service provider as a type of supplier in your policy for supply relationship. Show that you have cloud service provider you have lists of different providers. 
And then, of course, you need to create a category to show that you have uh, someone supplying you cloud services and what requirements you would have stated for them. So plus 18.1 is all about compliance. This is taken from 27,001. It also shows itself in 27,002 and it's about compliance, making sure you have considered, you have identified, you have listed and you have taken out requirements that are either legal requirements, com uh, com uh, legal requirements, uh, statutory requirements, contractual obligations, and stuff like that. You know, consider them so to avoid the situation where you might have a breach of any of those obligations and then suffer a fine. And consider it as a risk as well. So compliance is a very key uh, control and it's in clause 18.1. So for the cloud service customer, consider that issue of drawing out a list of laws and regulations speak with your legal team if you have one. If you don't, there must be somebody that you would use maybe uh, uh, once in a while based on subscription to cover your uh, legal angle. You would need to validate the list of laws and regulations and all other things in this regard that you need to comply to because compliance is very, very important. You might be operating well in other areas, but if you are not working within the ambit of being legal, as an example, then of course you might be shut down. So this ensures that you are working legally and you are uh, basically complying to all these requirements. It's the same for the cloud service provider. You should consider what legal jurisdictions govern their cloud service. And this is important too for the customer, like we said, you might be consuming software while the platform is hosted somewhere else. So for each one to know what laws and when you draw up the agreement to state specifically what jurisdiction governs that agreement is also important. We will now look at the extended sets. This is the extended control set. We look at the supplemental and this is now the extended set. So we have the shared responsibilities, shared rules, and responsibilities within the environment. And this, the control of course, is for the responsibilities to be properly allocated to the parties that have been specifically identified. They must be identified individually and different roles. So as an example, who would drop the agreement? That comes out here. Who would uh, attend to different kinds of breaches? Who would report to the um, supervisory authority in case of a breach, all that needs to be clearly stated. Who would pay a fine if it happens in such and such uh, situation? So all that is what this control is about. Okay. Uh, the excellent control 8.1.5 is about the removal of cloud service customer assets. Now the assets of the customer that are on the cloud service provider's premises should be removed and returned if necessary or as agreed. You may have say, said to destroy it, to delete it uh, or, or return it. So whatever is within the agreement, the cloud service provider should be uh, conforming to here. And this is about segregation in the virtual computing environment, basically protecting crosstalk between uh, applications, data, whatever it is. So cloud service customers virtual environment that is running in the cloud service provider's premises should be protected from other customers and even unauthorized persons like people that are walking to the environment. Because the customer isn't there physically, this control should have been applied. It is uh, very, very important. This is a, a major concern that we saw when we talked about threats in the cloud environment. Um, Crosstalk is an important uh, risk. It's an important risk. Uh, pardon me. Now, close 9.5.2 is the hardening for the virtual machine, making sure ports that are not necessary are closed 
uh, services that are not needed are closed, <coughs> excuse me, that the host is also hardened who might be doing virtual machine hardening, but you also need to ensure that the host is also hardened in that regard as well. Uh, physical access to the, to the box where the virtual machine sits is also covered under this control. So hardened, uh, making sure the patch, the versions of applications and utility programs are all up to date as well. This is all part of hardening the virtual machine. And of, uh, with regards to the last control, we talked about the uh, virtual machine hardening. There's also the pos potential of doing uh, penetration testing on virtual machines, testing to see whether the vulnerabilities that exist within your environment virtually are uh, exploited. So it's possible to do a pen test on virtual machines too, and even the whole cloud service. And then close 12.1.5 is the administrator's operational security. These are now for administration, but as tied to operations ongoing. So the procedures for operations administratively of the environment, this should be defined, should be documented and monitored. So how you want to administer the operations of your cloud environment. That is also covered in 12.1.5. And then we have the monitoring of cloud services. How do we want to monitor the cloud services? The customer should have the capability to monitor different aspects of the operation. Uh, what the way this typically is done is to create a dashboard if you have a very sophisticated or advanced and organized cloud service provider, they create for you a dashboard that shows your consumption, your bandwidth, whether you're going up, whether you're going down, how to add it. So you have a dashboard that gives you some capability. And that's what this is saying. Give the customer some capability to also monitor, not just take out service and add service, but to monitor the way uh, the provision of the service is going. And then finally, alignment of security management for virtual and physical networks. Okay. Upon configuration of your virtual networks, consistency of configuration between both the virtual and the physical should be verified based on a security policy of the, that the service provider should have. You want to ensure there's consistency, otherwise there might be leakage of information uh, we talked about the multi-tenancy aspect as well, uh, issues around the hypervisor uh, being a single point of failure and all that as well. So there must be an alignment of how you manage security between your virtual and physical networks. Okay, so now we'll look at the, the cloud the data that, it, that it's contained, whether business or personal, uh, and what it told us about what data we'll consider for uh, this course being foundational, jurisdiction and regulation. Once, once in a while, as we've been coming, we've uh, made reference to jurisdiction, we've made reference to certain regulations, so we'll have a look at that now. Now, now, cloud services are, as we saw, ubiquitous and perversive everywhere now. We have our, so, so, well, some do, our IoTs are now connected. You have Amazon Echo, we are using Zoom, as we, we mentioned yesterday, that's cloud services. It's anywhere there's an internet connection, you can have cloud services, essentially. But what about compliance? There are many countries that do, at the moment still don't have uh, a privacy act or equivalence of the GDPR that there is in the EU. Even the US is still grappling with getting consistent privacy act. So this now brings issues depending on the data type you have in the environment, depending on your relationship with customers, or even sometimes in a B2B situation, could be a B2C situation. How do you handle different types of data, business, uh, useful and sometimes customer useful data. Okay. So we have to look at all these considerations. Now, it helps to understand and comply with different privacy laws. 
there's a number of us here. I can see uh, quite a few people that I know here. And if you ask them why they've done some data protection courses or privacy courses, they'll tell you they haven't just spent time with UK specific regulation or EU specific regulation. In fact, in going through the training, they had to look at other regulatory uh, concerns and acts as well because you don't know where data will be stored. It is international, okay? Under cloud computing models, the data might be processed, may be stored, may be transferred, depending on its use, depending on relationships and requirements as well, okay? Sometimes a data subject might make a request and they are not where they are. When they give you that data, you might have to cross. So you see, it's important to have an idea of the different uh, jurisdictional privacy laws that exist. So before the GDPR came and gave the name of this type of data to be personal data, which used to be called and referred to as personally identifiable information. As a matter of fact, regulations like the, uh, the PCI, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, PCI DSS, still refers to uh, personal financial information as personal identifiable information. That is a major group. And HIPAA, the Health Information uh, Privacy Protection Act, a portability act as well, refers to uh, personally health, personal health information as PII, which is a major group. So it's referred to as personally identifiable information. That's personal data. It is any information that can be used to identify uniquely to contact or to create an individual, a single person, or combined with other pieces of information to build a profile and identify that individual. It is personal, it makes it makes an individual identifiable. That's why it's referred to as personally identifiable information. While non-personal data is any other data that would not allow you to identify an individual. Okay? Possibly it has been anonymized or uh, it is by nature and by origin not personally identifiable, okay? Not personal data, or business data. So if we consider regulations and laws as risk, because we may, if we don't comply, we will pay fine or fines, then it makes you aware of different requirements in that regard because you need to look at them then if you don't want to pay those fines if it means it will have an effect on your bottom line or on your reputation so the fallout and the impact of not complying to regulation is that you might suffer in terms of your reputation or your book balance okay so you want to understand that as well And if you're looking at the different regulations, then of course you want to get a clear understanding and an alignment with wherever it is you are based or wherever it is you do business. And if you do a lot of business outside of where you are based, as an example, say you're based in a country in Africa, uh, not so many countries in Africa have privacy acts already, and you want to keep doing business with the EU, and that uh, is, very important to the survival of the business. You want to be sure you understand the law there so you don't fall foul and it affects your business. Maybe there's a cessation of your relationship with whoever it is you transact business with. So many nations and groups of nations have their own regulations and rules. It's important that you understand and see whether you have equivalent checks or alignment with those laws and regulations. Okay? As an example, Canada has the PIPEDA, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act that applies to um, companies. Wale or Tunde, is it in government institutions or private institutions? I know it doesn't cover both. So it's either in government or in private. It doesn't apply to both. So you see that is an issue. You have to be sure who you are doing business with. 
and th that has always been there but even before the GDPR, before uh, the Data Protection Act of 98, even uh, Canada has always had this uh, this act. The U.S. now has what we refer to as the Privacy Shield that replaced the Safe Harbor, but even then, it doesn't apply throughout the U.S. Only for com or companies that have signed up to the Privacy Shield. And there are even still some contention whether it should remain valid. Uh, Safe Harbor was invalidated because uh, corporations in the U.S. were not protecting personal data as expected. And a certain Max Schrems took Facebook to court after a subject access request that showed that Facebook was not using his data as promised, as agreed. Okay? So that invalidated Safe Harbor. We now have the privacy show. We mentioned the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, the HIPAA, that is specific to health information. So we'll have a look at some of these acts and the timeline of the evolution of these acts and where we are today with the various privacy acts and rules that we have. Are we good to go? Can you still hear me? Yeah, right. We can hear you. Um, just be nice for you to, um, if you can inflex your voice a bit. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. It would be nice if you can inflex your voice, you know, raise okay. it a bit more. That's good. I'll just put the laptop to my face. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. No problem. Uh huh. So, thanks for that, Wale. The PIPEDA is, it governs private sector organizations and not government. That's what I was saying, uh, Banza. Thanks, Wale. So, PIPEDA governs governments, uh, private institutions and not government. So, you have to be careful because government uh, organizations also use personal data, but PIPEDA only covers private organizations. Cool. So this is the, uh, the timeline for how data privacy laws and acts evolved to where we are today. It's the U.S. in 1974 uh, had the U.S. Privacy Act that maintained restrictions on data held by government agencies. That was too specific and too rigid. And it's what still happens today. where different states have their requirements, different industries have their requirements in the US. Uh, and so we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 96, where health information is the concern. Then you have the GLBA Program Act of 99, and that is specific to financial, to non-public personal information. So you see, uh, we, you, if you do, uh, GLBA, you might also do PCI DSS for payment cards, that is for financial information, and it must be non-personal, and it must be financial, okay? You have to have an understanding of that. Even if you are based somewhere else, like we said, and you transact business with, say, an American company in that sphere, then you need to understand how to comply to that GLBA, because it becomes a requirement to you, or a driver at least. Uh, the fourth is the copper which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of 2000. It protects children's data that are, for those children that are under the age of 12. Okay, uh, how should that data be accessed? Should there be a parent by the side? What if they, uh, they, 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 they go past the age specified within that uh, act and all those kind of things? So it gives guidance on how children's data should be accessed and what protection should, ha should happen to it. And then, of course, the Privacy Rule 2000 fortifies the HIPAA and safeguards individuals' private health information. And that's where we are. Uh, Savas Oxley was a combination of uh, laws and regulation, and uh, it actually started with some a couple of Republicans, where it became a bipartisan 
uh, signed act that protects the public from fraudulent practices by corporations, meaning you, before you decide to become a corporation and take investments or financial, uh, do financial dealings with uh, consumers, you must have a set or a capital base that shows you're a serious business and potentially will not just go bust after uh, uh, a new relationship or things like that, okay? So it protects the public from fraudulent practices. All the things, all the checks that must be in place before corporations are allowed to interact with the public. 27,001, the 2013 version is what we're still using. That's been seven years in the running. Before then, we had a 2005 version. That also took seven years before it was reviewed. 2013 was reviewed last year, but it still carries the 2013 uh, badge with it. Okay, that's the, the one we said is the head of the family in the 27,000 series. Okay, the GDPR was released in 2018, and that aims to protect EU citizens' personal data. Uh, along with that, on the same day, we also have the release of the UK Data Protection Act to replace the DPA of 1998. And that too is to protect UK citizens' personal data. It's the answer uh, the UK has given for its Brexit so that they have an equivalent regulation to match up with the GDPR. Because uh, with the way things are, the UK for a while might be uh, a third party inadequate country. But with uh, the DPA, they're hoping to have a a, a clean and smooth transition to become adequate. Then the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2020 restricts how companies collect and use data. Uh, like we said about the US, they have industry specific privacy acts, they have state specific industry acts as well. So, copper is one of those. Now, auditing. Uh, with regards to auditing, it's not too different from the kind of audit you would do or that any of us that are uh, used to auditing or have seen auditing is the same thing that happens even in the cloud. It's just you will now audit based on cloud assets. And because it's a 27 standard with the head leading 27 in it, it means that you can use the same auditors for your 27,001 audit to do your cloud audit. They should be trained up on auditing cloud specific environments, okay? So we'll look at the stages of auditing, which also is a reflection of the typical stages of auditing IS and ISMS. You have the initial audit or the first time audit, the initial certification. If you're getting certified for the first time, you have a, a stage one audit, we have a stage two audit, okay? So first you have the initial, in your initial certification, you have a stage one and you have a stage two. The stage two incorporates 27,017. Remember, the stage one is more or less a documentary audit to see whether you are ready for the main audit, the detailed audit, which is a stage two audit, okay? Or whatever it is, the statement of applicability, the SOA, acts as a roadmap for auditors. The statement of applicability tells them what controls apply to you. Because it is created after a risk assessment and contains a list of controls, it's basically saying we have risk in this area, we have risk in that area, this control applies to us. That control out of the 114, or you take out the 37 from 27,002 and add the seven, from 27,017, you are basically saying, this is where you should be auditing us. Don't audit us beyond what applies to us. So that's what a statement of applicability is. It acts as an audit roadmap. It tells auditors, this is where you should focus. Don't go and audit us where we don't do business. So after the initial certification, you will have the stage one and stage two audit. The in-depth audit, you get certified. Uh, every year, every 12 months, you then get a surveillance audit. So you are audited every 12 months after that initial certification. 
we must come every 12 months to show that over the course of the, the 12 months behind, you have operated the way you should. You have protected data. You have been reasonable. You haven't been negligent. You've been diligent as well. So it's a reflection and a look back on the 12 months before they come to your premises as well. So that is what a surveillance audit is. And if you are maintaining and being a good uh, entity, a good organization, you would, you would keep your badge, essentially. So that's what the surveillance audit is. Let's go and check them up. The certificate typically should last for three years, but they wouldn't leave you to your own vices. Every 12 months, they must come and check and see that for the past 12 months, you've been doing well and protecting people's data. Okay? So that's what the surveillance audit is. And they recommend that you keep your, your certificate if you, you've been doing well. Now, on your certificate, like we said, it will be included or as a part of your scope statement related to your statement of applicability. You say, oh yeah, uh, this is where we are uh, getting our standard, our certificate on. Maybe we produce laser, laser printers or laser pointers. So the certificate would say for the service or for the provision of such and such service, creating or developing and selling or distributing laser pointers, whatever it is you do, would go on your certificate to say that's the area where you're getting certified. But you want to now include cloud services or to show your certificate, okay? So it is available on your certificate directory to say where assurance should be placed on you. Because that's what a certificate aims to do. It aims to tell a good story about you, to say you are concerned about security, you do security well, and of course, this scope now says which area that applies to. Is it the whole organization? Is it just the department? Or is it just for a key process within your environment? It goes on your certificate, okay? As you can see, there is no unique mark or a certificate issued for 27,017. It will still show you are certified to 27,001. But then within the statement, you will now include cloud service as one of those areas where you're now certified if that matters to you. Okay, so the scope expansion specifically focuses on the inclusion of ISO 27017, and the assessment will be relevant to those relevant elements of your ISMS, and of course, to where we say we have now added supplemental controls or extended controls. So we would look at that as if you are expanding your scope. So say, Initially, or in your initial certification, you did not include your cloud services, whether consuming or providing. Uh, then when you now have gone through uh, your first audit, you have a certificate, you now consider, hey, we're not doing cloud services. Let's now add that we are a serious company with our cloud service or cloud security. That is where you will now expand your scope beyond what the initial scope was, okay? And that's what this is saying. You want to extend your controls. So for your certificate, it can be included as a part of your scope statement related to your statement of applicability. Because when you, you are expressing yourself on your certificate, you are saying where you are certified. So you can say based on our statement of applicability, version one, version two, whatever version statement of applicability it is you're using so that auditors know your scope. Okay, so your scope statement uh, ref refers to your statement of applicability. And on the certificate, if you do that, it demonstrates that your management system is active and it supports where you are now expanded on. Nothing would be put on your certificate unless it's been audited and assessed. So that gives a good picture of the business. Okay. Yeah, some people pose as certificate certification bodies, but the, the truth is they don't have any authority to give out certificates. They are not accredited. So that's what is referred to as unaccredited certification. Make sure whoever it is that's coming to audit you and offer you a certificate to ensure that they are accredited. Just like you wouldn't go to a university that's not recognized. 
So accreditation is the recognition your certificate bears as individuals as well. Those of you that want to do the exam and get certified would ensure you do your exam with a recognized body that is accredited. And you need to also check the accreditation body to see that the accreditation body in turn is recognized. Okay, so there's a chain of recognition. Okay. As you see, when you are you want to get certified, you do not require an initial to the same person one certification. It can be all donors at once. It can be part, and if you are doing a certificate that is not accredited, say, oh, we are just doing it for the sake of it, uh, it can be performed by any organization at any time. Okay. But if you want recognition, if you want to be accredited, then of course it can be just done by anyone. Uh, and then the, deli the, the delivery of certificate will not include any mark. You will not see ANAB, you will not see UCAS, you will not see any of such, any of those kind of accreditation bodies that are regional. ANAB, UCAS, uh, and then the, in the US they have the IAS, the International Accreditation Service, and on and on like that. So different regions have their own accreditation service. If you're doing an unaccredited certification, you will not see any of that. Uh, there's also the possibility of an attestation report. So uh, smart learning or smart safe can do an attestation report. Oh, we don't want uh, accreditation. We just want people who know their stuff to make us feel good about ourselves, to tell us where we are, to give us a report about our status. So you can get an attestation report, okay? It's an assessment of your controls for 27,001, 17, and 18. It is, and it is similar to an unaccredited certificate. It does not require at the end to have a certification to say, hey, we are accredited this after the 7,000 certification. It's just looking at people who are external to us to look at us and attest to our control. You don't want to uh, boast or to tell people, advertise yourself as being certified or, or having accredited, accredited uh, certification. You could just say, hey, we only have an attestment report, and it is by PwC, it is by SmartSafe, it is by Microsoft, okay? So you see, when you are collecting an attestation report, it could be an opinion letter because uh, potentially consultants are those who have looked at you. It could also include an assertion letter, system description, identification, and of course, recommendation. You can also do a benchmark assessment. What that means is you are looking up to another organization. So it's similar to a self-assessment, but you're benchmarking yourself against uh, a competitor, as an example. Oh, they did it before us. Let's compare what we, where we are against them. They are our standard now. We we'll catch up to them. We are number two. They are number one. We we'll look at them and do it like them. We possibly might have an accredited certification and so we will use them as our benchmark, okay? So it does not require a certificate as well. It can be performed by any organization and yourselves. And it also gives a report that describes the audit performed and what controls were found there. So if you're starting a relationship with some people and they say, hey, what's, what's your status as a status? Oh, we might not be certified, but we've done a benchmark assessment, and this is the report we got for some businesses and in some relationships. That might be sufficient, but you need to check that. So now let's look at how uh, 27,017 can be applied to an ISMS, that is 27,001. So we'll look at uh, design, development, and things like that. So in design, uh, looking at clause four, clause four covers scope, covers an understanding of the business. So this is what you would do. You already have 27,001. You will now modify your scope statement as it applies. Ensure you, you include those areas that are appropriate by identifying internal and external issues, your strengths, your weakness, your opportunities, your threats, your, the political factors, your economic factors, social factors, 
technological factors, legal factors, and environmental factors. That's the internal and external issues. Has anything changed or is it still the same? Because now we're looking at cloud. Has the law changed? Have we changed technology? Is it thick clients still? Or is it now thin clients? Are we now virtualized? So those are the things you're looking at, okay? You're also looking at the needs and expectation of interested parties. Oh, some of our customers said, whenever we're going cloud, we should report to them every month until we are stable. So that you're now looking at interested parties. Who, do, do our banks need us to uh, change our insurance statement or our, our insurance category or even the, the business category? Because you get a code. In the UK, you get a, an SIC code or the different for the way you operate as a business. So you might say, oh, uh, uh, the government expects us to change our code. So all those things is what you're now modifying. You now look at your relationships with other organizations, like internal and external, okay? So interfaces and dependencies by the organization and even those by other organizations like suppliers and partners. For six is planning. And within planning, you have risk assessment. So as the clause itself is about planning, contained within it, there is risk assessment you would use to consider and identify those supplemental and external controls. Of course, you may have done it for 27,001, but now you are doing it for cloud controls. The control should be necessary to mitigate the risk that is applicable within your scope. It must also include an application of appropriate treatment. Appropriate treatment to the business is very useful because you will not be killing a fly with a sledgehammer as an example. It's appropriate. It will have important uh, assets. We are protecting them appropriately, not too much, not too little. So that's what this uh, will help us do. And where it requires us to uh, create a statement of applicability after our risk assessment for in 2001, of course, that means our SOA would also be affected. We need to adjust it. We must now incorporate the controls into the SOA to show that, hey, now we have uh, cloud controls. And as the requirement for 27001 says, when you pick a control, justify why you picked it. And if you exclude it, also justify. So we'll do the same here. Okay, that's why it says it's for the entire related standard. When you pick a control, tell us why you're picking it. When you uh, omit a control, tell us why you're omitting it. Is it that it goes against the law? Is it that you don't do the activity? Make sure it is justified throughout. Okay. And then, of course, uh, get it approved by management, your SOA. If it changes, it must be approved. Yep, you must modify your security objectives as well because that too will be affected. Your corporate objective, in terms of corporate security objectives, what does your ISMS aim to, get, to achieve? We may have listed them before, but because now you are including cloud security, it will be uh, adjusted to fit into your new mode of operation. Okay, also ensure to measure any modification and report it to. Plus 9.1 is about monitoring. It's about checking the thing you've audited. If you, it's about monitoring and checking the thing you've uh, deployed rather, the things you operate, the things you've implemented. So this is part of monitoring and it flows into auditing. So make sure you have measures in place that gives you an understanding of the performance of the security metrics in essence, okay? So measure, your performance, measure your risks, and measure your goals, your objectives. Ensure appropriate and proper criteria is applied, and make sure you are reporting to the right people so that action is taken. This is all about monitoring, measurements. You're getting the feedback on the performance of your security. So like we said, from monitoring, you go, monitoring is things you do within yourselves. Yep, operationally. Then audit is also a part of the check phase. But here now, it is a formal check. 
That means management has maybe a dedicated team or they outsource the auditing to PwC, to Deloitte, or one of those auditing firms, or even some small ones, even SmartSafe, okay? Making sure you are auditing it, you're measuring it, okay? You measure your performance with metrics, but then you have to do a formal check in terms of the audit. It's a requirement, it is cross 9.2. You cannot dodge it, okay? You must do an internal audit. You can incorporate this into your audit plan or program uh, that you have already. Make sure it considers your cloud security in this regard now. Assess your results and then report it to management so that they can remediate according to the risks. Okay? If you follow a risk based audit, it means you will attend to the uh, results, the output of the audit in order of priority as well. So, how has 27,017 being received with the market acceptance. Um, yeah, so because big players are involved in cloud security, they have put their heads together to ensure that a standard comes out. So the standard itself is market driven. They are involved in the development of the standard. So of course they would receive it very well. And if you say, hey, I'm ISO 27,017 trained, you get the same recognition. So major cloud providers, Amazon Web Services, Azure, Salesforce, GE Digital are early adopters of 27,017. And you know they would look for those who are trained up in it as well. Hey, what's your qualification? Oh, I'm ISO 27,017 uh, trained, you get recognition. They have adopted it early, okay? ISMS inclusion and separate certificates for some of them. Uh, the Cloud Security Alliance has improved, inc incorporated some of the controls into their cloud control matrix, a very wonderful document as well, the CCM. And then of course, uh, GDPR, like we said, in the revision that's going on now, is looking at uh, regulation. And because 27,001 already has the clause A18, which is compliance, that, and that forces you to look at things like uh, GDPR or other compliance standards and laws. So 27,017 is relatively new, even, if, even though it's five years old, comparatively it is new, okay? We've said that market adoption is driven by customers and sometimes by competitors. It can also be applicable and it applies as well to uh, the CSA STAR program, which is the, uh, it's, it's called a STAR program where entities, businesses sign up to and um, say, hey, this, this shows that we are serious. Well, we've signed up to the STAR program and the Cloud Security Alliance uh, of like-minded entities that show seriousness with protecting cloud services or considering cloud security. So that too has a cloud application. Okay, so um, I'll hand this back to Wale, but we'll take questions and we'll get set and prepared for tomorrow. So Wale would wind this down for us and we'll take the questions, thank you. All right, um, Roy, thank you. And um, yeah, wonderful delivery. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, and um, I believe that all of our audience, uh, they've learned something um, new today. Um, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, so where does this um, take us? Um, so I am going to pause the recording so that, um, I mean, so far it's been great. So let's quickly do um, a pause of that recording um, so that we can take questions. And um, if any, then we take it from